Just one second. Wonderful. So we're about to um, begin our the first uh, webinar that we are hosting in October. Um, this month, we're blessed to have two different groups join us. This is the first um, October webinar hosted by Persia. It's a pleasure to see some of you for um, the first time and the rest of you welcome back to our webinar. Um, as you know, this afternoon, we are focusing on um, outstanding Iranian women who have been um, the recipients of the Persia Mirza Khani Scholarship for Women in STEM at University College London. As you may be aware, Persia uh, Educational Foundation established this scholarship four years ago, five years ago now almost, following the passing of Maryam Mirza Khani, an outstanding Iranian woman scientist. Um, we are incredibly honored to um, have Professor Eli Keshavarz Moore, who is uh, an eminent professor at University College London. Um, and uh, she is also uh, the advisor to Persia Educational Foundation for this particular scholarship scheme. Um, I'm going to hand over the webinar to Professor Keshavarz from this point on, who will introduce our outstanding uh, panelists this afternoon who are recipients of scholarships from Persia Educational Foundation. And we will hear from them about their outstanding achievements throughout the past few years and the impact of this scholarship on their research. Over to you, Professor um, Keshavarz, thank you. Thank you, Tara John. This is indeed my pleasure to chair this session, which is a showcase as well as a celebration of young Iranian women's achievements in science and technology, and is also a testimony to the fact that the intellectual legacy of the late Dr. Mizahani has been continuing. We have, as uh, was mentioned, four uh, young women who will be discussing with you via slide of what they've done, where they've come from, what is their background, uh, what study they've done, and how they think it is going to impact our global world effectively. One of the things that you find is particularly important here that I found when I was actually looking at their work was the level of interdisciplinarity in their work. And that basically means that every single one of them had to learn beyond the discipline that they started with when they, start, they, they were at university before doing the PhD. And this is not a very easy thing to achieve. So I thank them all for being so successful in what they have done. You are, we are very proud of you. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, recipient who, who was a few years ago, Mahtab uh, Farahbash, who's going to- first uh, recipient. That's, that's, that's what I meant, yes. Uh, who had the first scholarship for, from the organization. And she's uh, worked at Child Vision Lab, which is one of the uh, departments of ophthalmology at UCL. Given that her background, it is very interesting to see how she actually developed her project. Over to you, Mahdab John. Uh, thank you so much, um, Eli John. Um, it's wonderful to be here to share about my work. So just to give a little bit background about myself. Um, I was born and raised uh, in Shiraz. Um, and then um, I always imagined myself doing a PhD. So even when I was 15, when people used to ask me what you want to do, I would tell them that I really um, want to do a PhD and do research and become a scientist one day. So um, I did my uh, bachelor's in biomedical engineering. Um, and then during my course, I realized um, that I, I am very much interested in the brain. Um, so um, after finishing my studies, I decided to go and study neuroscience. Um, and that was when I moved to the uh, UK. Um, and um, just to also give a little bit of background about why I didn't continue in Iran, um, I, um, because of being a member of a religious minority, I was not able to uh, do the entrance exam to the um, master's courses in Iran. So I had to leave Iran and come to the UK. Um, I initially changed to neuroscience 
um, when I moved to the UK uh, for my master's, it was really challenging. Um, and um, yeah, I, I remember having difficulty recognizing uh, the accents um, uh, when I was doing my master's. So I had to record everything and come back home and then listen to them, repeat everything and then take notes. And after my master's, I, um, I just uh, applied for a few PhD programs and that's when I um, got accepted into UCL. Um, so maybe um, uh, Tahir Jun, if you could um, show my um, uh, research slide, thank you so much. So during my PhD, I um, did a research uh, titled uh, mechanisms of development and plasticity in normal eyesight and heritable eye disease. Um, uh, in this, um, basically in this project, I was focusing mainly on uh, patients who have a congenital disease of the eye called achromatopsia. Um, in, uh, patients with achromatopsia basically are born without specific um, receptors in the eye that allow us to see color, that allows us to see during the day, um, see fine, small details. So their vision is uh, really compromised um, um, since childhood, basically. So in my project, I worked with children who had this condition. And what's very exciting is that um, when I started my project, there was this very amazing new treatment called gene therapy. Um, that was going on. So these patients uh, were entering this uh, trial and uh, we were able to scan the brain of these patients before treatment and then after treatment to see if they are being responsive to the treatment. So for example, as you see on this slide, um, on the left-hand side, there are three images of um, three brains uh, that are showing like untreated, um, uh, an untreated child patient's brain and the same patient after treatment. And what you can see is that before treatment, we see lots of yellow RNG blobs, which show that there are no um, brain activation in response to the stimulus that we are showing these patients. But then after treatment, it, um, the brain is showing activity that is similar to a normal sighted individual which is really exciting. And this is, um, this is, this research is one of a kind, is very novel, uh, probably one of the first few gene um, therapy trials in human beings, um, but it was also very challenging. And uh, so we were working with children. They were, some of them were as young as five years old. And we have to really um, make sure that the, uh, tests that we have are tailored to children and they're excited to uh, play them um, and also specifically going into an MRI scanner was so challenging for children so um, we may I basically we made this really fun saving kittens game uh, where uh, children would um, be told that uh, while they're doing the experiment they are saving these kittens and we would give them prizes. So that really motivated them to the point that our tests became really their favorite and some of them really loved playing these games. Um, so in total, uh, it's really exciting that we are able to use these measures which, which are really unique. There are no other measures um, like this one that we designed anywhere else and they are really objective um, so uh, this has a great impact on, on the clinical advances in uh, visual science. Uh, we know that there are a large number of children worldwide who suffer from some form of visual impairment uh, during their life. And um, these methods can hopefully help us improve pediatric treatment um, outcome evaluation so that um, clinicians will be able to improve their um, treatments and really evaluate them. And um, it's very um, exciting also because we can use these um, methods to understand more deeply how the brain develops in health and disease and also um, how it changes, for example, after treatment, for example, what happens 
to someone who has never seen color their whole life and uh, what's going to change in their brain now that they're suddenly able to see color. So I think this is, this is a really um, deep, ancient philosophical question. And now we have the tools to answer them. Um, finally, I would like to really, really thank um, the Persia Educational Foundation to give me this scholarship. Uh, which uh, helped me so much during my PhD. As you all know, doing a PhD is very um, challenging. And at that time when I received this um, scholarship, um, it really boosted my confidence and it um, showed me that I'm on the right path, which was really, really valuable. Um, and um, it also helped me financially, well, which is um, obviously to say, uh, which meant that I was able to really only focus on my research. And uh, finally, it helped me to be connected and uh, network with other people who are interested in similar uh, type of science because, um, because it meant that my research is being shared with a wider community of people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting me. Uh, I obviously I need to be unmuted because I can't do it by myself because the uh, control is uh, with the actual with Tahere and colleagues. Now, thank you very much. Dr. Farah Bash, <laughs> for your contribution to the world's health, especially children. Uh, I just to say that any questions would be addressed in writing to uh, Tahereh, who would actually put them all together. And we're going to have some minutes at the end of the whole session for uh, us to be asking you and others questions and waiting for the answer. So thank you very much. On that point, I would like to move on to another one of our scholars here, and that's Negar Shahreza, whose area is mechanobiology. Now, this is interesting. Mechano, everybody thinks of mechanical engineering and biology, obviously, uh, most people know what biology is. So without any further ado, again, can we actually uh, have Negar, who's unmuted now, and can we have a change of the slide from this one, please? Negar, John, over to you. Thank you so much, Eddie, for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, my journey from Iran to the UK. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD project and finally about what meaning Mariam uh, Rizekhan scholarship impact is, has had on me. I was born in Tehran, Iran, in a very nice, supportive family. Uh, I grew up as a very cheerful, very naughty and super curious girl. I do remember myself always being in the backyard, playing with animals, insects, looking at plants, uh, watching their changes, leaves, blossoms, fruit, and coming up with many questions, asking, finding someone around to ask my questions, and so that sometimes people around me would get irritated by my endless questions. Because I was very curious about uh, animal, plants, nature, and human body. When I grew up, I decided to study biology. And that has been the most important and the best decision I have ever made in my life by now. After doing my master's at University of Tehran, I decided to do my PhD abroad and I ended up with University College London where I did my PhD on mechanobiology. It is worth mentioning that my background is in microbiology and in biology and when I started my PhD it was super challenging because I had no idea of engineering and initially it was super difficult for me because I had to work with this weird complicated engineering software with very complicated machine like laser cutting machine, like mini machine. And I had to learn 
how to work with very complicated microscope such, uh, such as home focal microscope, epifluorescent microscope. And it was even more worse for me because I was the first PhD student of my supervisor. And I was all alone by myself because I had no senior around to ask for any help to help me with troubleshooting my experience, my experiments, and also to train me on any, uh, any lab skills. So I had to learn all of them by myself. It was very difficult. Initially, there were many moments of failure, many moments of frustration, many moments of uns being unsuccessful, but I didn't give up. I worked days and nights, and finally I made my project work. The project was on the role of estromancers in the formation and stabilization of blood vasculature in the Mopalodix platform, which enables me to co-culture in two different types of cells and let them form vasculature. You can see here vasculature, and that uh, red liquid is something like blood inside the vasculature, which shows that this vasculature are real and represent uh, vasculature in our body. Uh, if you ask me what is the importance of the research that I have done, I can say that right now that we are talking and we are uh, attending this webinar, there are more than 100,000 people waiting for organ donation only in the United States. And every year, 7,000 people die, do, die due to uh, organ failure. Scientists have been trying to engineer organs and tissues to replace damage and uh, failed uh, tissues and organs, but unfortunately, they have not been successful. The reason is that they are not able to vascularize this tissue and these organs, this engineered tissue and organs. And my research was uh, my research shed light on the fundamentals of vascularization. And one day, using this data, using this finding, uh, scientists will be able to, in, to vascularize organs and save lives all around the world by, by uh, replacing failed and disease or uh, damaged organs by in vascularized engineered organs. Uh, regarding Maya Mirza Khanim scholarship, when I won it, I was the most and um, I think cheerful and happiest girl on the world. And not only me, but also my family, my friends, my relatives, my colleagues, everyone was very happy. I was very proud, feeling very honored to win such a valuable and prestigious scholarship. Winning Mariam Mirza Khan scholarship was not only, no, it's not only provided me uh, with enough money that uh, by that I attended two conferences around the in, around the euro, but also it boosted my confidence and made me sure that I am on the track, I am on the right path, and also uh, it was not all about me. Before winning Maya Mirza Khan scholarship, I was a very ambitious girl who always set goals and fought to achieve her goal to make uh, to make her goals. Uh, her dream come true. After winning Maya Mirza Khan scholarship, still I am the same girl, but I feel more responsible for girls and women around the world, in particular in Iran, who wants to do something impactful on human being life and on uh, in the world of science. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah Reza. Uh, we will have more questions for you in due course. Um, now I would like to pass on to uh, Sarah Kavidnia, who is working on aging. So we all want to know about that. So thank you for doing it. <laughs> Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to meet all of you here in this webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm a final year PhD student at UCL Institute of Healthy Aging. First, I want to show my appreciation to Persia Education and uh, specifically Mrs. Danish for their uh, kind perpetual support and also for providing us uh, with such an amazing webinar, which allow us to be familiar with each other and also with different uh, field of research that each of us are involved in. And I'm sure that is very useful. Uh, I was born in Tehran, Iran, and I did my master 
uh, at Tehran University of Medical Sciences in medical microbiology field. And then for further education and doing my PhD, I decided to uh, apply for a high qualified university such as UCL. And hopefully I got a position uh, in aging field. And it's very interesting a field for me um, because aging is a natural phenomenon, but it's not easy to describe and explain it. But uh, I can say is a correlated set of declines in functioning with advancing chron chron chronological age. And um, aging is accompanied with lots of consequences, for example, which adversely affect the health condition of humans. For example, everyday physical activities and also cognitive, cognitive tasks will be declined by advancing the age. Also, uh, the susceptibility to various uh, age-related diseases such as neurodegenerative disease like ALS, Parkinson, Alzheimer's disease, and also other, type, other uh, kind of diseases such as different types of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and et cetera, will be increased. So uh, if uh, we can, by doing research in aging field, if we can find ways and treatments and interventions which can prevent the aging process in humans, or at least if we can find ways which can slow down the rate of the aging, we can um, inhibit the adverse effect of these debilitating diseases. And also we can boost up the health condition of the people, specific, specifically the older people. And I think no one can comparable with um, giving the people to live longer and at the same time healthier. And I think it's a great bliss and joy in the life for every individual. And uh, the aim of my research, in fact, uh, as you already may know, I'm working on um, the, to investigate the influence of RNA polymerase activity on longevity and any age-related diseases. RNA polymerase uh, are key enzyme in the body which are important for uh, protein synthesis and growth and development. And uh, there are different kinds of these en enzymes and the collaboration of RNA polymerase one, two, and three uh, are important for uh, human health and growth and development. Uh, my PhD research is divided in two parts. One part is about the fly experiments and the second part is about the human genetic analysis. The fly experiments, I work with Drosophila melanogaster, uh, and I chose these small model organisms because 70% uh, of their genes is similar to humans, and also uh, they um, cheap, and also they're easy to work with. So because of these features, uh, I chose these small model organisms that for my aging research. And, uh, Previous studies about these flies, flies shows that uh, if we reduce the activity of one of these uh, RNA polymerases, which is RNA polymerase three, if we reduce their activity, we can extend the lifespan in these small flies. And now in my research, uh, because RNA polymerase is a kind of enzymes that transcribe about 600 genes, and to transcribe, they need some components which are called transcription factors, and uh, all of these uh, 600 genes doesn't, don't need the same transcription factors. For example, some of them need one kind of transcription factors. The, uh, the other part of the genes need another type of transcription factors. Which This table shows different types of transcription factors which are related to RNA polymerase tree. And I wanted to see if instead of reducing the whole RNA polymerase tree to extend the lifespan, what happens if just I, I found one transcription factor or one specific genes to reduce their activity and extend the lifespan. So by this way, there is no need to knock down or to knock down the whole 600 genes. And ju just by reducing one gene, I can extend the lifespan. And I found significant association for, for example, TF3A, which there is just one gene, uh, which is called 5S, that, uh, I found that if I knock down this gene, I can extend the lifespan. And this figure here is for one of my experiments that shows that the mutant fly, which is shown in pink, and the TF3A activity is reduced in these flies, can live longer comparing to the gray line, which shows the wild type flies. And also uh, uh, about the second part of my PhD research, which is, which is about the human genetics, uh, 
because uh, the final aim of aging research is to understand the aging process in humans. And the number of studies which have been done regarding this field is not a lot. And also the role of RNA polymerases in human aging process is unknown. So I wanted to see if the same association can be observed in human aging process as well. So instead of doing mutation in the genes and see what's their effect on human longevity, I um, look at the level expression of RNA polymerases. By using a method uh, which is called Mendelian randomization, I look at the level expression of RNA polymerases and I try to find out if there is any association with human longevity and any other age-related outcomes. And fortunately, I found uh, high, I found significant association, for example, higher expression of, I found higher expression of RNA polymerases three and one has a detrimental effect on human longevity and lower expression of these enzymes is good for human longevity and we can improve the human longevity. So it was a very, summary, a very brief explanation about my PhD research. Uh, but um, further investigations are needed, which can definitely be useful for human longevity. And um, I'm very grateful that I was awarded uh, Maria Mirza Khani scholarship on last year. And it was uh, exactly at the same time that I was doing my human genetic analysis. And uh, in a certain uh, of time, I had to accomplish my analysis and I was under uh, debilitating stress and pressure uh, because I had to um, produce some results for submitting my paper. And at that time when I awarded this amazing and valuable scholarship, it helps me a lot on that time. It helps me to focus and concent concentrate more on my research and analysis, which uh, I should mention, I should say that um, that scholarship on that time help me pave the way for me to produce significant results, which fortunately I could submit my results in a journal, which is called Genome Research. And uh, I think in, in the near future, my paper will be re released and I can ignore the positive effect of that scholarship on that time. And thank you so much. I'm very grateful and I appreciate it. That's lovely. So thank you very much. We're very much looking forward to you obtaining your PhD and moving to even more challenging uh, yeah. uh, places. Last, but of course by no means least, is Niaz Shukri. Now Niaz is dealing with things which are really uh, very scary. Uh, she, she's going to be uh, talking about it. I have to say, because I've been practicing saying it, is osteoradionecrosis. I can understand what it means, but it's a bit of a mouthful. So I had to say it. So I don't know how many times you have said, had to say it in your studies, but good luck to you. So please go ahead with your presentation. And thank you, Elijan. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm really grateful and honored to be in the presence of um, these phenomenal women and to be a part of a uh, Persia education community. Um, and also want to thank my mom and dad. Without them, none of this would be possible and they were my wings to fly. Uh, Persia education scholarship made, the, made, it to, made me to believe in myself and the path that I was on and I... Um, I took some courses to have qualitative interviews with the patients I'm dealing with, which is a, necess a necessary part of my research. Uh, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be um, either a lifeguard, a policewoman or a doctor, which is really odd. But when I grew up, I realized all these jobs had one thing in common and it was helping people. And uh, I think that's where my job satisfaction lies. Uh, I studied to be a dentist uh, in Tehran University of uh, Medical Sciences. I'm originally uh, from north of Iran, sorry. Um, uh, during my in undergraduate, I, um, I realized I really, uh, I developed an interest in oral medicine. And oral medicine is the medical part of dentistry. and. Um, I chose to write down my um, undergraduate thesis with oral medicine department. 
And only two years after my graduation, I was lucky enough to be accepted in a um, world leading university such as UCL. And I continued my studies in UCL in oral medicine. I made it in Dean's List in 2019, and now I'm doing my PhD in oral medicine in UCL as well. Um, the title of my PhD is Development and Validation of a Specific Patient Reported Outcome Measure for Osteoradionecrosis of the Jaws in Head and Neck Cancer Survivors. The acronym for it is the Voucher Study. It's a very complicated name, but it's not a complicated thing. I'm going to simplify it for you. We are all familiar with head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer is the sixth most common cancer in the world. Every year in UK, 12,500 people develop head and neck cancer and 4,000 of them die. Uh, the treatment of head and neck cancer is usually by surgery, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy. And I know these uh, percentages do not add up to 100, and that's because uh, some, um, some of these managements are, is used as a combination. Uh, surviving head and neck cancer is not the end of the journey for these patients. They have to live with the complications of cancer for the rest of their lives. One out of uh, one in ten of head and neck cancer survivors develop a condition called osteoradionecrosis, which means um, dead bone due to radiotherapy. Um, you can see in these pictures, what you see is the dead bone, which is exposed through the skin or gums. Imagine how this, how unconfident, how unhappy this person would feel, how hard it would be for them to, to speak or to chew, to, I mean, to eat food. This is where we say this disease is affecting patients' quality of life. Uh, what I work on is oral health related quality of um, uh, quality of life. There is the, the problem is there is no definitive treatment for osteoradionecrosis and all these patients are only being treated with the, for, uh, for the symptoms they have. And all this is because we do not have a universal tool that is designed only for these patients to, and uh, for the clinicians to, to find a treatment and to fully understand this disease. My studies shows that none of the tools that has already been used in these patients are reliable or good enough uh, to be used in these patients. And um, so here is where I come to the scene and all my PhD is about is to design and then to validate a tool for these patients. Uh, so we can be able to measure the quality of life and compare different treatments on them. And we would be able to understand this disease. I, um, I've worked with many uh, head and neck cancer patients uh, when I was doing my uh, master's in UCL and I talked to a lot of them. This, is, this subject is um, uh, very close to my heart and I hope um, my PhD uh, would be what makes us one step closer to understanding this disease and find a treatment for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Again, we're also looking forward to Absolutely. hearing from you again when you finish. Um, thank you to all our four presenters who've done an thank excellent job. Uh, what were, uh, there are several questions which have been sent through the chat uh, to, uh, to us uh, that I'm going to be actually going through them. Now, uh, they haven't actually said who these questions should be directed at. So uh, if I just randomly choose you is just it's totally random so I apologize if if uh, that's not what you expected to hear I have some questions on my own which I will address later on um, it appears that there is uh, a great interest to find out about some of the projects that you you guys are doing in in Iran uh, so does any of you uh, know of projects which are similar to the ones that you're doing uh, happening in Iran, because these PhDs are very specialists, and uh, uh, 
they're asking me whether this is something which is happening in Iran as well or not. Does any of you have any awareness of it? Uh, can I answer this question, please? Please do. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, in, in Iran, no one, is, no one is using microfluidics platform to understand the fundamentals of vascularization, but this platform is used for other applications. For example, it's for modeling diseases or for, for drug screening, but not particularly what I am doing here. Maybe because we do not have this uh, very uh, complicated microscope like confocal and epifluorescent microscope back home. That's why this platform cannot be used in Iran to, to study vascularization. But for other purposes, such as drug screening, yeah, it is used. Thank you very much. Has anybody got anything to add to this? Uh, do you know in your own fields, for, for instance, Nias Johnny, we're just talking about what you were saying. Is anybody doing anything similar to what you're doing back in Iran? Um, by the papers that I have read, I know um, someone is doing a clinical trials on how to uh, treat osteoradial necrosis, but not designing a tool for it. Okay, so as, as you can see, everybody just with the audience that um, our scholars here are very much at the forefront of what they're doing. And you'll be surprised to know that some of the things that they're doing may not be possible even in the UK outside the departments that they've been working in. So it's not as if these are projects and uh, tools and equipment are, that are easily available. And in fact, the expertise is usually very high to come by. Um, there is another question saying, uh, what are your plans in terms of service to the Iranian community? I can give a, a answer, but I would welcome what you do, <laughs> your, your answers as well. I think by way of the fact that you have proved that you can be a, a, um, an achiever, a global achiever, and to overcome many difficulties in order to be where you are in itself to me is a major service uh, to the Iranian in community both male and female, and I congratulate you on that. So, uh, but however, since the question has been asked and I have to ask you the question, if any of you feels that you would like to say something in addition as to how you intend to serve the Iranian community that you already are through your publications and work that you're doing. Any, anyone wants to make a comment on that? Please, Matt, John. Um, something that comes to mind that I, I've actually been thinking about um, also during my PhD is that um, it would be really wonderful to share the data that we collect here. Maybe, maybe not now, because for example, I don't own my data. It like my supervisor and the lab, they own the data. But if one day we get to a point where we do own our own data that we collect, um, especially because these equipments are not available in Iran at the moment and maybe it would be really difficult to make them available. Um, so instead we, we can uh, maybe just share our data so that um, scientists and um, researchers in Iran um, can do research on, on this data. Uh, thank you for your answer, and maybe I can sort of qualify and add to what you're saying in the sense that the data that has been collected, you are obviously uh, by default publishing, and through publications, obviously the data in your graphs, in whatever form that you're presenting tables or whatever, is, is um, uh, something that can be shared. That's why you're publishing. And I would encourage, for instance, if you think of colleagues that might want to actually engage in uh, trying to do some work and getting hold of the information that you have, encourage that you can, you can, you can. it's not a question of necessary ownership, it is a question of being able to find a way to collaborate. Now, there's another question which has come up and says, do you accept volunteer patients? Now, I think that this is probably one for Nias because you're the one who's <laughs> actually seeing patients. So uh, I don't know what, why that's been asked, uh, access volunteer patients. So. Okay, um, we would definitely uh, accept volunteer patients, but the patients we are working with are head and neck cancer survivors who are 
um, dealing with the complications, which is osteoradionecrosis. We would love to um, interview with them and um, they would be very valuable sources of information for us. So yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. There's another question which was very much in line with what we just discussed uh, with uh, Mahda, and that was to do about how do you plan to share your knowledge with Iranian students? Now, <laughs> one of the things is that uh, publication itself is a very important international uh, um, without border type of communication. And uh, I very much encourage that students to be able to actually write to you if they can't hold up the paper so you can actually discuss it with them. But over and above what I'm answering, which you obviously, the, the, the platform is for you. Uh, have you thought any of you to uh, sharing your data or not sharing data, but actually sharing your knowledge, which is the correct word used in the question, uh, your knowledge with Iranian students? Who would I, uh, Sara, would you be able to actually, so you've been quiet and I, I just feel that maybe you would like to have the platform here. Uh, you're on mute, can, can, can she be unmuted please? Naz, would you be able to, ah, uh, oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. Yes, definitely, I'm eager to, for example, always I think about, if uh, it's a great idea, if I can find a way to, for example, set up the uh, experiment, similar experiments that I'm doing at UCL instead of health, healthy aging, it would be great if I can find a way to set up the same experiments in my country. And yes, bring my knowledge to share with the students, with, uh, with, the, with the scientists that are interested to set up these kind of experiments because aging studying, as I know, it's not, it's a very new field and I don't think that uh, there is any experiments and research uh, in Iran. So yes, it would be very nice. Good, I, yeah. th 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 thank you very much for your answer. Um, th there's a question which says, uh, how hard was it for you uh, to do a technology-based, a STEM-based uh, study uh, in Iran? And what sort of advice have you got to give for those who are in your position and are women and trying to study in areas which is known to be unconventional? So uh, let me see, who is the person who would, uh, Negar, would you be able to answer that? I know you're very passionate about this. Uh, sorry, I just got a, quiz, got a question. I was reading that question. Could you please uh, do your question? Yes, of course. Um, how hard was it to do what you did in Iran? Oh my God, it was very difficult. <laughs> Although I studied at the University of Tehran, and it is known as the best university in Iran, but we suffered so much from shortage of even consumable, let alone uh, materials for doing research. For example, if I wanted to do PCR, I ordered the items of my interest and I had to sometimes wait for six months, seven months to receive the order. And when the order came, it was expired and I couldn't run, I couldn't conduct any experiments, you know. And money was a big, big challenge for us. You know, uh, people who have done biology know that it is very weird to wash tips or to collect them and again reuse them. You know, if you say this someone, some, someone in the Europe or in the U US you, in, or in the UK, tell someone that you used to wash tips, autocollate, and again use them, they, 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 they would think that you do not know anything about science, but we had to do that because we, we, we were struggling with money, with resources. Uh, but although I was, not only me, also, uh, also my, schoolmates, we were struggling with shortage of money, resources, all, uh, we all passed and we had uh, papers out of our uh, pro master's project. I finished my master's having two papers, original papers. And so I, I must congratulate all of you who have managed to actually overcome many adverse conditions in order to get where you are. And I hope that you're going to be a, a beacon to other young women uh, in the same position as you 
to actually persevere and uh, go forward. There's a very good question which has come up, and this is a question that uh, I was keeping for myself, but I can see that Dori Donna Harris has asked it. So I shall ask you, some of you, two of you have uh, finished your PhDs, two of you are still doing it. Now, starting with those of you who have finished it, um, what has been, what are you doing in terms of your future? Uh, have you got anything planned? Uh, what, what do you want to go? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? So can I ask, uh, obviously Mahdab was the first person to finish. So I ask Mahdab first and then Nego. Thank you. Um, so I started working as a postdoctoral researcher at the Child Vision Lab. And uh, this is going to be for one year uh, from now. And um, hopefully afterwards, I will move on to other projects um, and do you wish to stay in research or do you wish to actually move on to work, you know, in the commercial world? That's a great question. I, I do always wonder about that. I think, <laughs> I think any, anyone in academia will, will struggle with this question for the, for the rest of their lives. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's amazing to also have industry experience. And I'm not against having that experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still, I, but yeah, I'm still really um, um, trying to know uh, where I'm gonna end up. Super. Uh, yeah. Well, that is, I think that's, the, the, this is interesting that when you have high achieved, uh, uh, achieving people, the world opens up and then the problem is where to go next. So. I, I sympathize with, with your uh, not knowing where, where to go next. But I know that, Negar, you've been very, very active uh, since you finished uh, your PhD, uh, having put a paper into um, Nature, uh, which is the top journal in, in, in the field. Uh, you've been trying to uh, work your way through the system, getting a position. Would you like to say what you've been doing? Yes. I finished my PhD two months ago, so I just graduated. Uh, I have been actively applying for positions at top universities in the US. <laughs> I got shortlisted for a position at the University of Harvard. <laughs> and after three times being interviewed, very tough interviews, and I do believe that I did best, my best. And I was very good at interviews, but I got rejected. <laughs> it's fine, it was a great <laughs> opportunity. I just great experience, I mean. But when we were having this webinar, I just received an email that I got an offer from Azon, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies around the world uh, as a scientist. So from November the 1st, I'll be a scientist, an in vitro scientist at Azon in London. Congratulations to you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Um, now, I know that Sarah and Yaz, you two are still in the middle of it, but do you have any aspirations for the, fu for the future? First, Sarah and then Yaz. Yes, uh, I'm interested uh, in, now I think that I'm interested in to get a position as a postdoc because I'm interested about my own research and I want to continue it. Uh, but also at the same time, sometimes I think about some companies, for example, DeepMind, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah, I know it's <laughs> competitive, and but I think about it, and I like to try to at least apply and see what happens next. And I think I should try, I should go for it, and then I can find in the future what is real my interest. And then, yeah. <laughs> That's good, Sarah. Sarah, Mia, how about you? I already work part-time as well, and... Um, um, my supervisors are um, motivating me to um, to do a specialty program in oral medicine afterwards. I'm kind of interested in it um, because I wanna I wanna be more in touch with patients. That's that's mm -hmm. where uh, I, I'm more of a I want to be more of a mm, hands on cures. Yeah, yeah. Super. Th thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We have another nice question which says, what advice do you have for young women in Iran? You're now, you know, doing to have done things abroad, but what is your advice to those who are in Iran? How do they, should, should they actually get, stay in there? What advice do you give? Uh, can I 
I answer the question? Please, please. I believe with my own experience, uh, my advice is that never give up, stick to your dreams. And sometimes we think that it's impossible to get our dreams and wishes and this thing and the, the aspirations that we have. But with my own experience, I believe that whatever you want, you can get it. And it's just by, you should, uh, it can be achievable by hardworking and just try for it. And I'm sure uh, the, the doors will be open. The doors That's lovely. Will be open. Thank you very much. Uh, they say, they, they, there's a uh, comment saying that you're all very inspirational. Would any of you envisage in the future when you've done your stints at first talk or what, uh, do, 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 are you envisaging going back to Iran at some point? to actually continue with what you're doing or starting something new for, for in your area? Have you got any, any, any thoughts? Can I answer this question, please? Please. I really wish to go back to Iran and, do, and continue my career there, but I know that it is impossible because there is, I, I won't be provided with the facilities I needed. I need to conduct a good research. So if Go to Iran is just a waste of my, my, my talent, waste of my time, everything. If I stay here, I can help other talented students to come here to do their PhD or their master's under my supervision, you know. But if I go to Iran, I will be one of them and I cannot conduct a good research. So I have no plan to go back to Iran, but definitely when I, when I retire, I go back to Iran, definitely. <laughs> yeah, has anybody else got any to add to this? Okay, uh, on that note, I think that we're getting very close to the finishing line. I want to uh, very much thank you all for extremely <laughs> inspirational, I like that word which was used, inspirational uh, talks. Uh, I think that uh, especially nowadays that we have the ability to do things like teams, uh, there is more opportunity for young people like yourself to uh, help women uh, in Iranian communities to uh, actually learn from your, 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 your know-how, learn from your skills and push forward. So uh, maybe uh, there would be a situation when we can actually have those equipment, those, those labs, uh, so that you can actually contribute and do some work, work there. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tyre John, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Nas for helping, organizing, and putting a lot of effort into this. And of course, it goes without saying. Sorry? <laughs> and also, specifically, I would like to um, thank the organization, uh, Persian Education, for providing such an amazing, amazing incentive to young Iranians. Uh, we've heard from all of them that that has been very important to their lives. Thank you. I hand over to you, Tyra John. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Keshav Arzmore, for this fantastic panel. Thank you to all the panelists, to our Persia Mirza Khani scholars for your presentation today, for the amazing work you've been doing for the really, truly, I mean, you could tell I, I got emotional and I'm in tears. Um, because it is so difficult for Iranian women, um, for women all over the world, but particularly Iranian women, to overcome the many barriers that we need to face, unfortunately, in our homeland in order to make these um, uh, dreams come true. So um, uh, I'm deeply moved by all of you. I'm incredibly grateful also to uh, Persia Educational Foundation, for which I have the honor of uh, working at this point. Um, I think it's, it's um, uh, appropriate to remember our founder, uh, Mr. Ansari, whose vision almost 30 years ago created this foundation um, and has now led to providing this opportunity formally for, for Iranian um, young scholars. Um, it, I think it's also appropriate to remember Professor Mirza Hani, whose example really has inspired all of us to, to go um, as far as we can, go all the way, uh, receive our PhDs, postdoctoral positions, research scientists, uh, private sector, and do our best as much as possible for the Iranian community, for the world community, um, wherever we are. And hopefully we will be able 
um, using technology and other means possible to do our best for the community in Iran. Um, maybe we will be able to hold a webinar similar to this in Persian so that we're able to inspire young students in Iran to learn from your research and also to continue the work that you have started. I want to also thank everyone who has donated to the Persia Mirza Khani Scholarship. We welcome more dona donations. We're about to hand our fifth um, scholarship to uh, a young scholar, such as these lovely women um, in May 2022. Um, and so we welcome any support we can uh, receive. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon and best of luck with all your efforts in serving humanity and for advancing the cause of education. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone.